So I'm Jessica Einhorn, I'm Dean of SAIS, and I thank you all for joining us this evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you, the students, the alumni, the friends and faculty, to celebrate the book launch of our distinguished professor of American foreign policy, Michael Mandelbaum, here with his esteemed co-author, New York Times columnist and Pulitzer Prize winning author, Thomas Friedman. It's a great pleasure to welcome Tom back to the SICE podium. Those of you who are loyal readers of Tom Friedman's column, and I know that includes a lot in this audience, already know of the friendship of our two authors. They seem to have the best of bonds, based on intellectual respect and activated by their mutual pleasure in finding ways to explain the world's problems through brilliant writing. That is both understandable and entertaining to the layman and expert alike. I greatly enjoyed this most recent book, which combines so much of what we have admired in each of them before. As I told Professor Mandelbaum, my only regret was that I did not start underlining all the best metaphors and turns of phrase from chapter one onwards. I think we should sponsor a web-based event uh, with competition for the top 10, and I know that we'd have at least 50 entries. In my reading, That Used to Be Us is a presidential platform waiting to be adopted and shared with the wider public. As you know from their last chapter, or perhaps you don't know, but as you'll discover, our authors are not necessarily expecting either major party to seize on the real agenda before us, and perhaps we'll hear more about their hopes for how electoral change will take place in the form of a third name on the ballot at this important juncture in our history. But you've come here to spend as much time as possible with our dynamic duo, so let me begin the program with an introduction of my colleague, Professor Michael Mandelbaum, and he in turn will introduce his friend and co-author, Professor Mandelbaum is the Christian A. Herter Professor, a founder of the School of American Foreign Policy and the director of the American Policy Program at SAIS. He's one of America's leading authorities on international affairs and is known for his extraordinary ability to explain with great clarity the meaning and the consequence of complex global developments and trends. The World Affairs Council of America named him one of the most influential people in American foreign policy. He's the author of co-author of over a dozen books. Just in the last 10 years, he began with the ideas that conquered the world, peace, democracy, and free markets in the 21st century, which has been translated into seven languages, including Arabic and Chinese. And the frugal so superpower, his 12th book, the one before this one, was published in 2010. Professor Mandelbaum and Professor Friedman, welcome. And Professor Mandelbaum, the podium is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, we are going to do a sequential duet. And I'm going to speak second. So let me introduce the first speaker. I'll be brief because to this SICE audience, and I think to our C-SPAN audience as well, uh, he really needs no introduction. Uh, my friend and co-author, Thomas L. Friedman, is the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. He's a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner. He is the author of five previous books, all extremely influential, all bestsellers, including From Beirut to Jerusalem, and the world is flat. Tom, it's a pleasure to welcome you to SICE. The floor is yours. You. Michael, thank you very much. It's, uh, am I on here? Uh, I'll turn it. It's on. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, it's great to be back here at SICE. Jessica, thank you for having us. And thank you for attending. Um, I um, didn't know I was a professor, but I am now, and I'm going to keep that and pocket it. Um, so uh, what Michael and I are going to do, as he said, is a se sequential duet. We're going to kind of break up the book. This is how we wrote it, and um, uh, try to give you a basic overview, and then we look forward to taking questions. Now, you know, when we've been on the road for a few weeks now, and whenever people hear the title of our book, that used to be us. 
the first thing they ask is, but does it have a happy ending? <laughs> and we tell everybody it absolutely does. We just don't know whether it's fiction or nonfiction. <laughs> that really depends on us. Now, you might ask, how did two foreign policy wonks end up writing a book about domestic American politics and policy? Uh, and the answer, as uh, Jessica hinted, is that uh, Michael and I are old friends, and we are neighbors out in Bethesda. And we've basically been having a 20-year running conversation uh, about foreign policy, often interrupted with, honey, I'm on the phone with Michael. Can you just wait a second? Um, and we started to notice something in the last couple of years. We would start out every conversation talking about the world, uh, but we would end every conversation talking about America. And we basically realized after a while that America, its fate, future, vigor, and vitality uh, really is the biggest foreign policy issue in the world. And unless we really tackled that and thought that through, uh, we really couldn't think clearly about foreign policy. Um, you know, Michael and I are both uh, uh, American nationalists. Uh, we really do believe that uh, America plays a pivotal role in holding up the global system. We are the tent pole that holds up the world, for better and for worse, and we think uh, for most of the time, and in most places, for much better. We provide enormous global governance for the world, and Michael's written about that in his last book. But we are convinced that if this tent pole buckles or frays, uh, your kids won't just grow up in a different America. They'll grow up in a different world. They'll grow up in a fundamentally different world if we cannot provide the American dream for another generation. After all, when Britain went into decline, America was there to pick up the pieces and really provide that global governance. And if we now go into decline, who is there to pick up the pieces? So Michael and I um, are, are movie buffs, uh, Michael in particular, actually. And we have a lot of movie references uh, in the book. And um, there's one in particular that really captures for us kind of the pivotal moment we're at. It's from that 1958 classic, Touch of Evil, starring Orson Welles. A, murder, a movie about murder, kidnapping, conspiracy, and corruption in a town on the Mexican-American border. Wells, as you recall, plays a crooked cop who tries to frame his Mexican counterpart for murder. At one point, Wells stumbles into a brothel and finds the proprietor, Marlene Dietrich, who is also a fortune teller with cards spread out in front of her. Read my future for me, Wells says. You haven't got any, she replies. Your future is all used up. It was really that fear about our own country that prompted us to write this book. Now let me jump right to the conclusion. Uh, we do not believe that is the case. We don't, certainly don't believe it is inevitable. But it was out of concern about our future right now and how we think it through and how we do what is necessary to make sure it is not all used up that brought Michael and I to write this book. And so let me just share with you the first few paragraphs, because it really frames the whole book. The opening chapter is called, If You See Something, Say Something. This is a book about America that begins in China. In September 2010, Tom attended the World Economic Forum Summer Conference in Tianjin. Five years earlier, getting to Tianjin had involved a three and a half hour car ride from Beijing to a polluted, crowded Chinese version of Detroit. But things had changed. Now to get to Tianjin, you head to the Beijing South Railway Station, an ultra-modern flying saucer of a building with glass walls and an oval roof covered with 3,246 solar panels. You buy a ticket from an electronic kiosk offering choices in Chinese and English, and you board a world-class high-speed train that makes the trip 72 miles in 29 minutes. The conference itself took place at the Tianjin Meijing Convention and Exhibition Center, a massive, beautifully appointed structure, the like of which exists in few American cities. As if the convention center wasn't impressive enough, the conference's co-sponsors in Tianjin gave some facts and figures about it. 
They noted it contained a total floor area of 2.5 million square feet and that, quote, construction of the Meijing Convention Center started on September 15, 2009 and was completed in May 2010. As I read those lines, I walked around saying September, October, November, <laughs> December. That's eight and a half months. Returning home to Maryland from that trip, I was describing the Tianjin complex and how quickly it was built to Michael and his wife, Anne. At one point, Anne interrupted, excuse me, Tom, have you been to our subway stop lately? <laughs> now, we live in Bethesda and often use the Washington Metro Rail subway to get to work in downtown Washington. I had just been at the Bethesda station and knew exactly what Anne was talking about. The two escalators there had been under repair for nearly six months. <laughs> While the one being fixed was closed, the other had to be shut off and converted into a two-way staircase. At rush hour, this was creating a huge mess. Everyone trying to get on or off the platform had to squeeze single file down one lockdown escalator and up the other. It sometimes took 10 minutes just to get out of the station. A sign on the closed escalator said, the repairs were part of a massive modernization project. <laughs> what was taking this modernization project so long? We investigated. Kathy Asato, spokeswoman for Washington Metro, said that, quote, the repairs were scheduled to take about six months and are on schedule. Mechanics need 10 to 12 weeks to fix each escalator. A simple comparison made a startling point. It took China's Teta Construction Group 32 weeks to build a world-class convention center from the ground up, including giant escalators in every corner. And it was taking the Washington Metro crew 24 weeks to repair two tiny escalators of 21 steps each. We searched a little further and found that on November 14th, the Washington Post ran a letter to the editor from Mark Thompson of Kensington, Maryland, a Metro rider. He wrote, as someone who has ridden Metro for more than 30 years, I can think of an easier way to assess the health of the escalators. For decades, they ran silently and efficiently. But over the past several years, when the escalators are running, Aging or ill-fitting parts have generated horrific noises that sound to me like a Tyrannosaurus Rex trapped in a tar pit, screeching its dying screams. <laughs> the quote we found most disturbing, though, was from a Maryland community news story about the long lines at rush hour. It quoted Benjamin Ross, a regular Metro rider, as saying, my impression, standing on line there, is that people have sort of gotten used to it. People have sort of gotten used to it. Indeed, that sense of resignation, that sense that, well, this is just how things are in America today, that sense that America's best days are behind it and China's best days are ahead of it, has become the subject of water cooler, dinner party, grocery line, and classroom conversations all across America today. So do we buy the idea, increasingly popular in some circles, that Britain owned the 19th century and America dominated the 20th century and China will inevitably reign supreme in the 21st century and all we have to do is fly from Tianjin and Shanghai to Washington and take the subway to know that? No, we do not. And we have written this book to explain why no American, young or old, should resign himself or herself to that view either. The two of us are not pessimists when it comes to America and its future. We are optimists. But we are frustrated. We are too frustrated optimists. The title of this opening chapter is, If You See Something, Say Something. That is the mantra that the Department of Homeland Security plays over and over on loudspeakers in airports and railroad stations around the country. Well, we have seen and heard something, and millions of Americans have too. What we have seen is not a suspicious package left under a stairwell. What we've seen is hiding in plain sight. We've seen something that possesses a greater threat to our national security and well-being than anything Al-Qaeda does. We've seen a country with enormous potential falling into the worst sort of decline, a slow decline, just slow enough for us not to drop everything and pull together to fix what needs fixing. This book is our way of saying something about what is wrong, why things have gone wrong, and what we can and must do to make them right. Michael? faces four large challenges, and those challenges are the spine of that used to be us. The book is organized around them. 
the first of these is the challenge posed by globalization, which, among other things, has brought two billion more workers into the global workforce over the last two decades. The second challenge comes from the revolution in information technology, with which we're all familiar, which is part of our daily lives, and which has, among other things, stripped away whole categories of jobs that hundreds of thousands, really millions of Americans used to do and at which they used to make good livings. Those jobs are now gone and they're not coming back and that's a huge challenge. The third challenge stems from the chronic annual deficits that the American government runs and the national debt that piles higher every year, the result of the accumulation of those annual deficits. Now, uh, those of us in Washington are familiar with the federal budget deficit, which is, to be sure, the most serious of them, but it's not the only one. It's important to note that all over the United States, there are state and municipal governments that have made commitments for pensions and other benefits in the future that they cannot possibly pay. Deficits and debt are not simply a federal problem. The fourth and final challenge is the one that stems from our pattern of energy consumption, our enormous reliance on fossil fuels, and the impact of the burning of fossil fuels on the world's environment and on its climate. Now, the stakes in meeting these challenges or failing to meet them uh, could not be higher. The extent to which we, as Americans, can meet these challenges will determine the rate of economic growth the United States enjoys in the future. And where the rate of American economic growth is concerned, the old saying applies. Lots of things are more important than money, and they all cost money. In particular, the rate of economic growth in the United States will determine whether the current generation of Americans is able to pass on to the succeeding generation, a country in which it is possible to do even better than the current generation has done. This is commonly known as the American dream. And the American dream today is very much in play and very much at risk. And the American dream has been the core of the kind of society that the United States has been for almost two centuries. But the implications for the success or failure the country has in meeting these challenges goes beyond the American standard of living. As Tom noted, the whole world is at stake in the sense that, as both of us believe, the United States plays a unique and uniquely valuable role in the world. The extensive foreign policy of the United States is, as Tom said, the tent pole that holds up the international system, an international system whose political and economic dimensions are today more benign for all the difficulties they have than has ever been the case in history. If the United States cannot sustain economic growth, we will not have the resources or the political will to sustain this vital global role. And if that happens, everyone will live in a world that is more dangerous and less prosperous. So the stakes, as I say, could not be higher. How are we doing in meeting these challenges? Not very well. We're not measuring up to the task. And for this, there are a number of reasons. Uh, we devote a chapter of That Used to Be Us to explaining why we've done so badly on what is our national agenda. One reason is that we misread the end of the Cold War. We thought that the end of the Cold War was a great historical triumph for the United States, and indeed it was, but it was also something else. It ushered in a world in which the United States would face and does face unprecedented challenges. And those challenges, unfortunately, we have all but ignored. Moreover, 
Some of these challenges are subtle, incremental, almost invisible. We've overlooked them, and one of the purposes of the book is to call them to people's attention. And there's a third reason we're doing very poorly in meeting our basic challenges, and that is, for most of them, in one way or another, some kind of sacrifice is required. And we as a people, we as a country, for a number of reasons that we outline in the book, have gotten out of the habit of sacrificing. And that will take an enormous toll on future generations if we can't recover our commitment to do what is necessary to secure the future. Well, there's another problem the country faces, and it too receives a chapter in That Used to Be Us. We've gotten away from what Tom and I regard as having been key to America's economic and social success over the last two centuries and more. It's what we call our formula for a public-private partnership for prosperity. It has had and continues to have five basic parts. The first part is education. Historically, the United States has educated its workforce, has educated its population up to the level of technology so that Americans could take advantage of whatever the existing technology was to become the most productive workforce in the world. Second, the United States has always invested in infrastructure. From the building of the Erie Canal at the beginning of the 19th century, this country has always built, usually through a, a public-private partnership, the best canals, roads, highways, superhighways, ports, and airports in the world. And these elements of the country's infrastructure form the framework for vigorous commercial activity. Third, especially since World War II, the United States has invested heavily in research and development to push outward the frontiers of knowledge and develop innovations that can be used commercially to bring to market new products and new services and thereby sustain American economic growth. The fourth part of the formula is in immigration. For most of our history, not all of it, but most of it, we have had an immigration policy that attracted, welcomed, and retained what we call high IQ risk takers. People able to discover new things and start new businesses that have contributed enormously to America's success. Fifth and finally, we've always striven to have and usually have had an appropriate regulatory environment. We've had regulations strict enough to prevent dangerous excesses, such as those we experienced in the financial system in 2008, but also a regulatory system not so strict and not so confining as to suppress and discourage the risk-taking and innovation upon which economic growth depends. Well, we've gotten away from that formula. We haven't renewed it. We haven't reinvested it. In some ways, we've forgotten it. And in order to prosper in this century, we have to get back to it and bring it up to date. Well, all four challenges are important, but we believe that over the long term, the most important challenge for the United States is the one created by the merger of globalization and the information technology revolution. And Tom will tell you about that. So, um, you know, one of the fun things for me in working on this book with Michael was um, uh, really to go back and think about what had happened to the forces that I argued had flattened the world in uh, 2004, because that was really uh, what we meant by the merger of globalization and the IT revolution. The world had gotten connected. And so when we sat down to work on this book, and particularly this chapter on the new challenge of the merger of globalization and IT, I went back to the first edition of The World is Flat, which I started in 2004. And I cracked open the book and looked in the index under F. And I discovered that Facebook wasn't in it. So when I was out there saying, the world is flat, 
The world is flat. Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was a sound. The cloud was in the sky. 4G was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. Applications were what you sent to college. And for most people, Skype was a typo. <laughs> All of that happened in just the last six years. None of those existed less than a decade ago. So what's really happened in the world, and I think we would agree, it was actually the most important thing that's happened in the world in the last 10 years, but it happened under the mask of the 2008 subprime crisis and 9-11, was that the world actually went from connected to hyper-connected. That's actually what happened. And it has fundamentally revolutionized the workplace, the education environment, and what students need to learn. Last time I had a book talk, there was a cameraman behind that camera. There isn't one now. That job was outsourced, as David Rothkoff says, not to Mexico or to China, but to the past. That's what the merger of globalization and IT is all about. And it is changing everything. Now, you can see this often in just little, little stories in the newspaper. I love collecting these things. I was in India in October 2010 and was reading the Hindustan Times in the morning. And there was a little item there. It reported that a Nepali telecommunications firm had just started providing third generation 3G mobile network service at the summit of Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. The story noted that this service would allow thousands of climbers and trekkers who throng the region every year access to high-speed internet and video calls from the summit of Mount Everest using their mobile phones. Can you imagine the number of calls being made from the top of Mount Everest that begin, Mom, you'll never guess where I'm calling you from. <laughs> now, the hyper-connecting of the world shows up in other ways as well. Another small item in my own newspaper, the New York Times, about six months ago, it reported that Grinnell College, a wonderful small liberal arts college in central Iowa where my mother-in-law went, was later chairman of the board. Grinnell College this year, one out of 10 applications came from China. Of that, they have 1,600 students there, one out of 10 of their applications in, for the class of 2011 came from China, and 50% of those had perfect 800s on their math SATs. So when I wrote The World is Flat, I said, you know, you're, you're really not just, you know, competing now. With, now. Now you are literally competing for a place at Grinnell with someone at PS21 in Shanghai, uh, someone at Tolstoy University in Moscow. You are literally now competing head to head with them in this hyper-connected world. Now what does that mean for the workplace? Because what Michael and I decided was, before we talk about education, we actually really need to talk to employers and say, what does that mean for the workplace? So we broke up this section of the book, which is really the biggest section of the book on education, into four chapters. And they said, we like movies. And so the first chapter is called Up in the Air. Many of you, I'm sure, saw that movie, uh, where uh, George Clooney uh, plays a, a, a person whose job is to go around firing people face to face. And he loses his job when his new assistant figures out a more efficient way to do that with the internet. That movie is the movie of our time. It is a brilliant film about what happens to the workplace when it gets hyper-connected. Now, labor economists, to put this in their jargon, speak about a phenomena called skills bias polarization. And what that means in English is that if you have the kind of skills, problem solving and uh, creative thinking skills to take advantage of this hyper-connecting, you, you'll be fine. But if you don't now, there is nothing for you. So the labor market's getting divided up into sort of three broad segments. The first are people who have non-routine skills. That's what all of you aspire to, what I aspire to. 
These are people who are doctors, lawyers, uh, musicians, artists, accountants, um, professors, hopefully journalists, uh, people who, who do things that cannot be described by an algorithm and therefore cannot be outsourced, automated, roboticized, or digitized. Because basically what happens when the world gets, goes from connected to hyper-connected is that if you imagine the world was like a big class, one of Professor Mandelbaum's class here at Johns Hopkins, the whole curve has risen. The whole curve has risen. Because every employer now, like the people who run C-SPAN, now have access to cheaper and cheaper, more and more powerful automation, resources, productivity tools, robots, and not just cheap labor, but cheap genius. So the whole curve rises. So we all have to rise with that. We all have to find something extra. Those are those non-routine skills and jobs that won't be outsourced, automated, digitized, or roboticized, or given to a foreign worker. So that's at the top. In the middle, of course, were routine jobs. And those are being just crushed. Being a cameraman, turns out, was a routine job. It could be roboticized. It has been roboticized. When the world gets this hyper-connected, whatever can be done will be done. And that's been done. Those jobs have collapsed. Now, at the other end of the spectrum are people who have non-routine skills that are local and have to be done face-to-face. -face. That's the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And their skills, their skills and their pay will depend on the health of your local economy. But those are kind of the three categories. Now, what we really discovered is that the big change, we only discovered this from interviewing employers, in going from a connected world to a hyper-connected world, is what we're demanding now from those two non-routine workers, those at the top called creators, and those at the bottom called servers. Okay. And what we discovered is that Every employer now is looking for the same employee. They're looking for people who have non-routine, critical thinking and problem-solving skills, dot, 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 in order to get an interview. They're looking not just for creators, not just for accountants and lawyers and scientists. They're looking for creative creators. Creative lawyer, creative scientist, creative journalist, creative professor. Because if you're not a creative professor now here, Jessica, she can use all this technology to bring in the best professor in the world and put them right up against you. And don't think that ain't going to happen in the next five years. So it's not enough anymore to be non-routine. You have to be creative non-routine. And it's, by the way, the same as on the other end. It's not just to be a server. You have to be a creative server. Now, the way we really discovered this was in the next chapter. It's called Help Wanted. We went to four generic employers, and we asked them, what are you looking for? We went to a high-end white-collar firm, a Washington, the head of the Washington office of a, a big national law firm, Nixon Peabody. We went to a lower-end uh, white-collar firm, the outsourcing firm in India, actually, where I wrote The World is Flat. We went to a blue-collar firm, DuPont, and we went to the world's biggest green-collar firm the US Army. And we asked all four of them the same question, what are you looking for? And as I said, they're looking for people who can do critical thinking and problem solving in order to get an interview. Because what all four are actually looking for, they explained, are people who can not only do the job, this complex task, but invent, reinvent, and re-engineer the job as they're doing it. Because when the world gets this hyper-connected, change happens so quickly that the big boss up above, he or she can't possibly know what's going on. Therefore, they need every employee to actually be an innovator. So for instance, we interviewed Jeff Lesk, the head of this Washington law firm. One of the first things he said is, we just hired a chief innovation officer. You say, what? A law firm went out and bought hired a chief innovation officer? Well, what's that about? Well, I interviewed Jeff um, in the 2008 subprime crisis. In the middle of it, he happens to be a family friend. 
And at the time, I said to him, what's happening to your law firm? We were out for dinner. And he said, oh, Tom, if the business is off, we have to lay people off. I said, that's interesting. Who gets laid off first in a law firm? Is it last in, first out? He said, not anymore. Now, the people who are getting laid off are those who were in the height of the credit bubble when we had all that work. We gave them that pile of work. And they did that in a routine way, and they handed it back. They did it in a routine, non-routine way and handed it back. Some of them are gone. The ones we're keeping are those who came to us and said, you know, Jeff, we could do this, new work in an old, way, uh, this old work in a new way. Or we could do new work in a new way. Michael and I were fuddy-duddies. We're old fuddy-duddies. We had the pleasure and the great opportunity when we graduated from school to find a job. You will have to invent a job. That's the big difference. It may not be your first job you'll have to invent, but to keep that job, you will have to invent that job. There are, there are firms in Silicon Valley now that now do quarterly reviews of their employees, because if you're going through five product cycles in a year, you can't wait till the end of the year to discover at uh, Groupon or wherever that you have a bad team leader. You can get crushed by the end of the year. So everybody needs people who can invent, reinvent, and re-engineer their job. One of the most interesting examples of this was given to us by that head of that green collar firm. His name is General Martin Dempsey. Now you may have heard General Dempsey's name recently because he just is about to become the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, our senior military officer. But when we interviewed him at the time, he actually was head of the US Army Education Corps. That's why we interviewed him. But he has an even more interesting history. General Dempsey commanded the first armored division that took Baghdad from Saddam Hussein in 2003. And he told us this story. Five years later, he was commander of CENTCOM, the whole Middle East military operation. And in that year, in 2008, he went out to visit a forward base in Afghanistan, commanded by a captain somewhere out near the Hindu Kush. He spent an hour with that captain, and he realized after this hour that that captain out there near the Hindu Kush in his little base had access to more intelligence at the national and tactical level and more firepower than he, Martin Dempsey, did when he took Baghdad from Saddam Hussein in 2003. And therefore, he realized how we educate that captain and how we choose that captain has to be very different from before. One of the first things he did when he took over the Army Education Corps was introduce the idea of giving new recruits at boot camp an iPhone. First, you get your iPhone. Maybe within three weeks, the uh, drill sergeant will tell you, you download the app, you teach the lesson, I'm sitting in the front row. So they have completely revolutionized the Army Education Corps around this idea. How do we get everyone to produce their extra to not only do their job, but be able to invent and re-engineer the job as they're doing it? Now, this is a huge education challenge for us now. Because what it means is, and this is the next chapter, which we call homework times two equals the American dream. Because homework times one is not going to do it anymore. We have two education challenges. We need to bring our bottom up to our average so much quicker because we have so many people who are below average. And in this world where you have to be either a creative creator or a creative server, if you do not have a high school degree, and if you don't have a high school degree that allows you to get through some kind of two to four year college without much remediation, there is nothing there for you. We're speaking here at Johns Hopkins Sice, but at the mothership in Baltimore, very interesting. 50 years ago, what was the biggest employer in Baltimore? It was a company called Bethlehem Steel. You could get a job at Bethlehem Steel without a high school degree. You could join the union. You could have a good salary. You could actually buy a house, have two kids, a yard, a dog, and retire. You could go through the whole cycle without a high school degree, and certainly with a high school degree. What's the biggest employer in Baltimore today? Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. They don't let you cut the grass there without a BA. <laughs> they, you can't mow the lawn here without a BA. So we have, it will be, so we have two challenges. We need to bring our bottom to our average. And we need to bring our average so much higher to the global average with particular emphasis 
on what Tony Wagner calls the three C's of education, creativity, communication, and collaboration. So you have people who can not only do their job, but invent and reinvent it on the spot. As Ellen Coleman, the head of DuPont, says to us in the book, I need every employee now to be present, to be present all the time. Because in this hyper-connected world, and this is the last chapter of the four, average is officially over. What happens when the world gets this hyper-connected and your next boss has access to that robot or cheap genius or automation or digitization, average is over. You know, Woody Allen's dictum that 80 or 90% of life is just showing up is, as they say, N-A, no longer applicable. If you just show up for your job, okay, it, it, you're not going to have that job or thrive in that job much longer. There's a saying in Texas, you know, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, and all you ever get is all you ever got, that too is N-A, no longer applicable. If all you ever do is all you've ever done, trust me, in this hyper-connected world, all you'll ever get is not all you ever got. You will get below average. We are now all living in Garrison Keeler's Lake Wobegon, <laughs> where all the men are strong, all the women are beautiful, and all the children are above average. <laughs> average is officially over. And so what this means for education is two things. As I said, we need to bring our bottom to our average, and we need to bring our average so much higher. One requires more education, the other requires better education. Now we conclude this chapter and this whole section by trying to think through well, what, what is the right mode then for educators, for parents, as they think about describing and inspire this, this world and inspiring their kids to thrive in. And we would leave you with just sort of three attitudinal points that we would suggest. Think like a new immigrant. Think. Think like a new immigrant, okay? Think like an artisan, and think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, just off Highway 100. What do I mean? First of all, we all need to think like new immigrants. How does the new immigrant think? The new immigrant thinks that I've come to this country and there is no legacy spot waiting for me at Johns Hopkins size. The new immigrant understands that he or she is in a new world. And friends, we are in a new world. The hyper-connected world is actually a new world. We are all new immigrants to this world. And the new immigrant says, I better figure out what's going on in this country. I better see where the opportunities are, and I better pursue them with more energy and vigor and speed than anybody else. We are all new immigrants today. Approach the workplace like a new immigrant. Second, think like an artisan. That's an idea that Lawrence Katz, professor of labor economics at Harvard, has coined. And what Larry basically says, who is the artisan? The artisan was that person in the Middle Ages before mass production, before mass manufacturing. The artisan made everything one off, made every pair of shoes individually, every purse, every saddle, every utensil. And the best artisans took such pride in their work. They brought something so extra to their work they insisted on carving their initials into it. Do your job every day in a way that you would want to carve your initials into it at the end of the day. That's what insulates you from being outsourced, automated, digitized, or roboticized. Lastly, not everyone can you know, invent software like Steve Jobs or start a company like Michael Dell. But everyone's above average at something. Everyone can find they're extra somewhere. Maybe it's the employee at the nursing home. Anyone who's had an aged parent in a nursing home knows how much you would pay for that one nurse or healthcare worker who actually engages your aging parent and puts a smile on their face. That's their extra. Everyone has some extra they can bring. And I really learned this in being on a visit home. I'm from Minneapolis. And having breakfast at Perkins Pancake House at Highway 100 in Minneapolis with my best friend, Ken Greer. 
we're having breakfast, and I ordered three buttermilk pancakes and scrambled eggs. Ken ordered three buttermilk pancakes and fruit. And after 15 minutes, the waitress came, put the plates down, and simply said to Ken, I gave you extra fruit. She got a 50% tip from us. <laughs> because that waitress, God bless her, she didn't control much, but she controlled the fruit ladle. And that was her extra. Everybody has got to find their extra. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, very easy for you to say, Mr. New York Times columnist. <laughs> OK. I, 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 I was born at night, but not last night. I, I know what you're saying. No, you don't understand. You see, I inherited James Reston's office at the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. What a thrill. And I got to meet him once. I suspect, though, Mr. Reston used to come to the office back in the 1960s and 70s and say to himself, I wonder what my seven competitors are going to write today. And by the way, he probably knew all seven. Walter Lippmann, Mary McGrory, Stuart Alsop. I, I do the same thing. I come to the office every day and I ask, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are going to write today. <laughs> because if I can't write better than the best Indian columnist or blogger when I'm writing about India, or the best Iraqi in columnist or blogger when I'm writing about Iraq, you can go to Real Clear Politics. You can, you can get them right up on your screen, right next to my column. So we're all caught up in this. We all need to find our extra because average really is over. We have perhaps some excuse for not addressing effectively the first two challenges, the challenge of globalization and the IT revolution. The combination is in some way subtle, took place underneath the radar of great political events. It's not always easy to know how best to adapt to these challenges. But when the, where the third and fourth challenges are concerned, the challenges of deficits and debt and of energy and climate, we have no such excuse. These are not hidden. They're not subtle. They're well known. And yet, really, for the last two decades, and especially for the last decade, not only have we not been addressing these two challenges effectively, some of us, in some cases many of us, influential people, have been denying that they even exist. We have a quote from Vice President Cheney, former Vice President Cheney, in speaking with then Secretary of the Treasury, Paul O'Neill, who was objecting to another tax cut that the administration was proposing because he thought the country couldn't afford it. And Cheney said to him, uh, you don't understand. Reagan proved that deficits don't matter. And as for energy and our climate, recent surveys show that almost half of all Americans believe that Global warming, that the impact of human activity, especially the burning of fossil fuels on the world's climate, is just an ugly rumor or a hoax. It doesn't exist. Well, would that it were true. Would that it were true that deficits don't matter and global warming doesn't exist. But unfortunately, it's not true. They do matter. And it does exist. And we are going to have to come to terms with them in ways that we haven't even begun to do. Now, where deficits are concerned, whatever else may be said for, against, or about the Tea Party, at least it has focused the attention of the national government and on our problem of deficits and cumulative national debt. And yet, even though the political class, the Congress, and the president are seized with this issue, are focused on it, talk about it all the time. None of them has presented the kind of approach that is necessary to cope with this challenge. What is necessary is a three-part approach. First, we have to cut spending. 
And that means reducing federal programs, important programs, valuable programs, programs on which people, good people, decent people, hardworking people rely. We are going to have to make adjustments in our two major so-called entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare, because as they are structured now, we simply cannot afford them. And anybody who says that we can go on as we are with these two programs is not being serious about this challenge. But second, we also need more revenues. We're going to have to collect more in taxes. That doesn't necessarily mean raising marginal rates on income taxes, or at least not raising them all that high. We can probably get a lot of revenue by closing loopholes, and we can certainly get some by uh, the kind of tax that Tom and I strongly advocate uh, in that used to be us, and that is an energy tax. But one way or another, we're going to need more revenue. And anybody who says we don't, that we can go along with the tax structure just as it is, is not being serious. But those two measures by themselves will not assure our future. We also have to make investments in our historic formula. We may need to spend more money on education at the primary and secondary level, and we certainly have to spend more money on infrastructure. By the estimate of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the infrastructure deficit in the United States today, the amount of money that it would cost just to bring us up to par is $2.2 trillion. And we certainly also have to spend more money on research and development to generate the innovations that will lead to the new products and services of the 21st century. So we need all three of these things, and nobody is proposing that. As for climate change, well, we know for sure that the geophysical phenomenon at its heart, known as global warming, is real. We know that certain heat-trapping gases form in the Earth's atmosphere. They reflect heat back to the Earth's surface and raise the temperature of our planet. We've known that for at least a century, and we know that without this phenomenon, we wouldn't be here, because without it, the Earth would be too cold for human habitation. We also know that the Earth's blanket of these gases is thickening because of, the, uh, because of human generated activity, mostly burning fossil fuels. We know that the Earth's temperature is rising because we can measure both. We can measure the greenhouse blanket and we can measure the Earth's temperature and we have no plausible explanation for all of the rise in the Earth's temperature except for human generated activity, except for principally, although not exclusively, the burning of fossil fuel. So we know this is happening. This is not a hoax. This is as close to an established fact as this kind of science can ever come. Now, having said that, when you go further, there are lots of uncertainties. We don't know how far and how fast the Earth's temperature will rise. We don't know what the effects will be. Scientists talk about floods and droughts and storms, but the science we have is not able to predict with any precision whether such events will take place, where, when, and at what magnitude. And therefore, we don't know with any certainty just how much damage, just how much social and economic damage global warming will do. So there is lots of uncertainty surrounding the effects of global warming, although none really involved with its existence. But that uncertainty is not a reason for complacency. It's not a reason to do nothing. It's true that because of these uncertainties, the, effect, the effects of global warming could be more benign than most scientists believe they will be. But equally, that uncertainty means that the effects could be much more severe. 
it is conceivable, perhaps not the likeliest outcome, but certainly conceivable within the boundaries of possibility that global warming, if it goes unchecked, could do catastrophic and irreparable damage to the planet, which is the only habitable one we know about. As somebody put it, and as we quote in That Used to Be Us, we are running an uncontrolled experiment on the only home we have. So we need to start doing something about this problem. And the essence of any response that is serious to this problem is raising the price of fossil fuels. We won't get off fossil fuels immediately, overnight, or completely in the lifetime of anyone in this room. It's a difficult, complicated, long-term problem. But elementary prudence dictates that we start now. And the way we start is by raising the price of fuel. And no one is advocating that. Well, there's one more reason besides those I mentioned before that we're doing so poorly in coping with our four major challenges and thereby putting our future in jeopardy. Our political system is broken. It's simply not working. It is dysfunctional. And the basic reason for that, as we outline in a chapter devoted to American politics in that used to be us, is the extreme polarization dividing our two major political parties. Republicans and Democrats are, in political terms, farther apart than they've been in 100 years, possibly farther apart than they've been since the 1850s, and we know what that led to. Now, there are complicated and deeply rooted reasons for this. It didn't happen overnight. The process took four decades to play out. It wasn't the work of one administration or one party or one individual, and it won't be easy to fix. But it is an enormous problem for us because it means that the two parties cannot cooperate to bring forth the measures that we need to cope with these large and growing challenges. It means that the political system is paralyzed while these challenges grow worse. And that problem is aggravated by two other things. The growing importance of money and the increasing power of special interests in American politics and the new media, which has many great advantages brings many blessings to American democracy, but also has the effect, in general, of increasing polarization. So we not only have these four great challenges, we have a serious political problem in trying to cope with them. Well, from here, there is both bad news and good news. The bad news is that the paralysis of our political system is not the only reason that we're having such difficulty in meeting our major challenges. The good news is that there are, we believe, and say in that used to be us, things we can do to put ourselves on the right track. And to conclude, Tom will tell you about both. So as Michael said, um, we're, we're really stuck right now politically. And um, we're also stuck for another reason. We had a values decline in this country. Uh, a chapter in the book is called Devaluation, um, where we note two hearings that took place on Capitol Hill um, five years apart. Uh, the first was the five great baseball home run hitters who sat bicep to bicep at that witness table at that congressional hearing on steroids to explain how at least some of them use steroids to hit grand slam home runs. And five years later, not far away, on that same Capitol Hill, in another hearing room, the five big Wall Street bankers sat briefcase to briefcase and explained how they use steroids called credit default swaps in order to hit grand slam home runs. We have been cheating ourselves. What happened in baseball is exactly what happened on Wall Street. 
rather than building muscle the old-fashioned way, we injected ourselves with steroids. Now, we know the greatest generation, the generation born and hardened in the Depression, forged and steeled by World War II, and ultimately, ultimately brought us the victory in the Cold War. This was a generation that believed in two things. One, save and invest. Save and invest. And we are actually now eating through all their savings and investing. And the other thing they believed in were what our teacher and friend Dove Seidman calls sustainable values, values that sustain. Our generation, both Michael and I are baby boomers, we, as Kurt Anderson said, we thought Mardi Gras and Christmas were so much fun, we'd make them every day of the week. We believed in borrow and spend. We believed in situational values. Do whatever the situation allows. If the situation allows me to give you an $800,000 mortgage and you only have $10,000 in income, and all I've asked you is can you fog up a knife for ID, I'd do it if the situation allows it. Just do it. As I said, our book is built around movies. And of course, the great movie of our time about this issue is Jerry Maguire. Show me the money. Jerry Maguire, as Dove Seidman points out, is all about the struggle in one firm between the guy who wants to do things sustainably and all his partners who want to act situationally. And we had a values decline. And that's also very much part of this. So that really brings us to the concluding section uh, of the book. And I just want to make two quick points before we close. One is, what do we do about it? Well, what Michael and I argue in a chapter called shock therapy, uh, which is a phrase we chose very consciously, as you recall, that was the what we thought we needed to deliver to the post-Soviet Union to get their economy going, shock therapy. We are now the ones who need shock therapy. Because right now, for us to be able to solve our big problems and basically rebuild, revive, and re-energize our formula for success, we need two things. First, we need to be able to act collectively. That's what we've lost in this political paralysis and values decline. Because all the problems we face today that Michael laid out, they all only have collective solutions. You cannot solve these problems without collective action of a scale of World War II or the Cold War. And that's why you know, we believe our fundamental choice right now is we're either going to have a hard decade or a bad century. Either we act collectively in the next decade and dig out of this hole, or we're going to have a bad century. Those are really the choices. And the politics we need, though, is not only one that involves collective action, it's a politics that has a hybrid agenda. Because we now need to do three things at once. We need to, as Michael said, we need to cut spending. We have made promises to your generation that we cannot possibly keep. Second, we need to raise revenue. Because we cannot just shred Social Security and Medicare. We are capitalists. A capitalist system needs safety nets if it's going to thrive and survive. Because capitalism is brutal. It has wild swings. And what enables capitalism to thrive and continue is that people know there are safety nets under there. The old saying that if you want to live like a Republican, vote like a Democrat has some truth to it. Okay. <laughs> We need to cut spending, we need to raise revenue, and we need to invest again in all five pillars of our formula, education, infrastructure, immigration, rules, and government-funded research. We need to do all three at once. Now, it happens that that hybrid agenda doesn't quite correspond, yet at least, to the agenda, to our satisfaction, of either party. Neither party's quite got that hybrid. And that brings up the shock therapy. Uh, what we believe is 
We, we, Michael and I do not have a candidate. We don't have a party. We have an agenda. And if that agenda is taken up by President Obama in the vigorous way that we think it needs to be taken up, we are Obamaites. If it's taken up by Rick Perry or, 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 or Romney or somebody else, then, then we're for them. We're for whoever comes up with that agenda. But if nobody comes up with that agenda, what we would argue and hope for is that someone will start an independent candidacy or third party that will put that agenda before the public. Because without that kind of shock therapy that proves that there actually is a radical center in this country that would support that agenda of 30 to 40 percent, without that, we're never going to get out of this paralysis. Now, this isn't pie in the sky. We saw Teddy Roosevelt do that in 1912. We saw George Wallace do it with an agenda we didn't care for in 1968. And we saw Ross Perot do that in 1992. Let's remember, Ross Perot made Bill Clinton a deficit reducer. Ask Bob Rubin. Ross Perot had 40% of the vote at one point. He won 20%. And he was nuts. OK? <laughs> OK? I mean, at the end, he thought little black helicopters were chasing him, OK? But his agenda, his agenda linked up with where the center of the country was. And it had a huge effect. And that's why there are two things we would tell you about a third party if one were to emerge. One is that candidate, he or she, would not win. And the other is, we believe, if he or she had this agenda, they would have a bigger impact on the country's future than the person who does. Because the only way to break out of this paralysis is by changing the incentives. Now, these people are politicians today. They're not stupid. I mean, most of them, at least. You know, they're not stupid. Um, they're clearly operating on a different set of incentives than we are. So I've been saying we're having an economic crisis. And they're having an election. And the two barely overlap. So it's like they are in a parallel universe operating to different incentives, as Michael said, set by special interests, money in politics, the media, et cetera. The only way to change that is to change the incentives. Life is about incentives. Move the cheese, move the mouse. Don't move the cheese, the mouse doesn't move. We need to move the cheese to show these two parties that there is a huge chunk of cheese right in the center of the country. So instead of always directing their eyes to their extreme flanks, I mean, watch the Republican debate. I mean, it's about one person trying to get to the right of another person, trying to get to the right of another person, trying to get it. And then somebody is brave enough for showing the courage of literally a Medal of Honor winner to say, Maybe climate change exists. That sh I didn't say that, you know, real loud. I mean, just sort of maybe. I mean, if you hold it up to the right light. I didn't say that, but some people say climate change exists. Yeah. <laughs> that now goes for courage in the Republican Party. You know, some people believe in gravity. Some people think the apple came down from the tree on Newton. Some think the apple came out of his head. I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, <laughs> that's how crazy it's gotten. And unless you change the incentives and get people back to that center, nothing's going to change. And that's why we make this argument in this chapter called shock therapy. So let me just end by saying you are now entitled to ask. You said when you began that the two of you were optimists but frustrated optimists. We now get the frustration from whence comes your optimism. And it comes from one of our closing chapters, which is simply called, They Just Didn't Get the Word. Because this country today is full of people still, thank God, who just didn't get the word. They didn't get the word that we're down and out. They didn't get the word that we're depressed. They didn't get the word that we're in a decline. And they just go out and invent stuff, and start stuff, and fix stuff, and heal stuff, and collaborate with people. The country is actually exploding still with energy from the bottom up. And this chapter is stories of these people. 
If you want to be an optimist about America, stand on your head. Because the country looks so much better from the bottom up than from the top down. And I really learned this in, in writing my previous book on energy called Hot, Flat, and Crowded, where I went around the country talking about energy, giving talks to groups. And it was amazing the number of people who came up to me and said, Mr. Fried, I have this energy invention, this idea. I got, I got this duck. It paddles a wheel, blows up a balloon, issues methane, turns a turbine. I, I heard the craziest stuff. But it told me the country is alive with people who, who haven't got the word. I, opening our our book tour, I went up to Knipiak University in New Haven. I get there, the president of the university says, we just started a medical school. You just started in the middle of the recession. You didn't get the word, you know? <laughs> There's all kinds of people out there. Just travel around the country. I do these energy talks. People give me their business cards, you know? I mean, I'd go back to my hotel room after every talk and empty my pockets of business cards from energy entrepreneurs and innovators. I mean, it's great, you know, rock stars get room keys. I get business cards, but they're, they're, they're very exciting in their own way, you know. <laughs> and what they tell you is that the country is alive. It really is. And the hyper-connected world is great because it has downsides, but the upside is I can start anything. I can start a multinational overnight for less money than ever before. It's not only your boss who can do that. You can do it too. If it's not happening, if it's not happening, it's because you're not doing it. There's no other excuse now. So what we say in the book is if we were to draw a picture of America today, it'd actually be a picture of the space shuttle taking off. You've seen that space shuttle. All this incredible thrust coming from below, that's all those people out there who just didn't get the word. But in our case, the booster rocket, Washington, D.C., is cracked and leaking energy. And the pilots in the cockpit are fighting over the flight plan. So right now, we can't achieve escape velocity. The escape velocity we need to get into the next orbit, the next way we deliver the American dream. But it's all here. It's all here. That's why this forward-looking book has a backward-looking title. It's all here. We had a formula for success. We have a formula for success. There's nothing we need to learn from China, although we wish China well. And China can thrive, and we can thrive. There's nothing we need to learn from Brazil. We wish Brazil well. They can thrive, and we can thrive. Our simple point and the conclusion of this book is everything we need is right here in our past. The history books we need to read are our own. And the country we need to rediscover is America. That used to be us. And it can be again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, let me also say that uh, books are available for uh, purchase. And Did you say books are available, Michael? <laughs> a gratifying number of you have already availed yourself of this uh, valuable service. Uh, they will be available uh, after the conclusion of this session, and they are already signed. So. Uh, we have uh, uh, a microphone. Uh, we have a gentleman who wishes to ask a question over here. A bunch of them over here. Yeah, let me pull this. Hard to reach, but uh, we'll count on it being worth the, the trouble. Thank you. Uh, this is Yunus Sömez. I'm actually not an American, mm -hmm. a Turkish. But uh, I hope starting from uh, escalators in DuPont Circle, it goes well. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's really a problem for us as well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the second thing, uh, about, I'm, I'm going to ask about incentives. I checked your book. I saw a third party uh, issue on the book. Can you a little bit ask, uh, uh, open the issue of like how you can change the incentives? I mean, what kind of things that you are thinking about this? 
Well, uh, it's a good question. It is spelled out in the chapter on shock therapy, and that used to be us. Um, politicians operate according to incentives. Uh, but what they're trying to earn is not money, or at least not overtly. They're trying to earn votes. And they will do what they need to do in order to get votes. Now, uh, the reason that they behave as they do, the reason that the two uh, parties are so polarized is that the political system has evolved in such a way that the, the core members of each party, the so-called base, who control the nominations, are much further apart than the country itself. So the parties don't really represent the country all that well, and the people in the middle, because of the way the system works, don't really get the kind of voice that they deserve it or that they should have uh, by virtue of their numbers. Now, how do you change that? Well, if there is a credible independent candidate who runs on the kind of platform that we have outlined in the book, and if that candidate does as well as Theodore Roosevelt did running as an independent in 1912, or George Wallace did in 1968, or Ross Perot did, uh, in 1992, that will demonstrate to both parties that there is a large block of voters up for grabs. And each of these two parties will have a powerful incentive to move to, to the center, to co-opt some of the issues of this centrist candidate in order to get that candidate's voters in the next election. And the incentive will be powerful because if such a candidate runs on the platform that we suggest, uh, those voters will be available either to Republicans or to Democrats, and each party will have an incentive to try to capture those voters, lest the other do it, and the party become the minority. So if you have a substantial block in the middle, you draw both parties to the middle. That has happened in the past, and we believe that it can happen again. That's how in political incentives work. Yes, sir, right here. Hi, Matthew Asada, Foreign Service Officer and a member of the elected board for my public sector union. Hmm. And leafing through the index of the book, I looked for three things. Mm -hmm. I looked for labor, I looked for union, mm -hmm. and I looked for new social contract, mm -hmm. or anything to that regard. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find actually a single mention mm -hmm. of any of those. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you in this internationally competitive world, what does that new social contract look like? Can we today afford things like Sunday differential? Can we afford things like nighttime differential? Can we afford things like overtime pay for our labor? Uh, what does it look like? Yeah, that's a very good question. I want to get to something that's in my notes. Um, and obviously when you're you know, doing a book like this, you don't get to touch every subject. But I think that my, my answer to you would be this. I'm going to read just something from the book. Um, that, that, that's relevant. Um, I think we can afford all of those things um, in theory, provided you as a worker or as a collective uh, are delivering unique value creation. Because if you're not, um, we can't afford it. Uh, not we, your boss can't afford it. So let me just read you um, a section from the book. It's an interview, it's a, actually a, a insight from John um, Jaywich, who, who is head of a variety of technology companies and startups, including Red Prairie and Five Cubits. He also is, teaches MBA courses. Uh, he wrote this on his blog. He actually posted on a column of mine, and I thought it was compelling enough to repeat it. I'm in the business of killing jobs. I kill jobs in three ways. I kill jobs when I sell. I kill jobs by killing competitors. And I kill jobs by focusing on internal productivity. All of the companies I have been a CEO of through best in practices, services, and software eliminate jobs. They eliminate jobs by automation, outsourcing, and efficiencies of process. The marketing is clear, less workers, more consistent output. I reckon in the last decade I've eliminated over 100,000 jobs in the worldwide economy from the software and services my companies sell. So there, I've said it, I'm a serial job killer. Any job that can be eliminated through technology or cheaper labor is by definition not coming back. The worker can come back. The most 
most often come back by being underemployed. Others upgrade their skills and return to previous levels of compensation, but as a whole, the productivity gains over the last 20 years have changed the landscape of what is a sustainable job. So what then is a sustainable job, JOS asks. The best way I can articulate what is a sustainable job is to tell you, as a job killer, it's a job I can't kill. I can't kill creative people. There's no productivity solution or outsourcing that I can sell to eliminate a creative person. I can't kill unique value creators. A unique value creator is, well, unique. They might be someone with a relationship with a client. They might be someone who is a great salesman. They might be someone who has spent so much time mastering a market that they are subject matter experts. So my answer to you would be is that I mean, I can give you whatever answer you want. Yes, the, it, people deserve overtime. They deserve everything, all these benefits. But I will tell you that in a hyper-connected world, um, they will only be sustainable. Whatever they get through labor action and, and collective bargaining, they will only be sustainable if those workers are unique value creators. Otherwise, that company won't be there. Next question. Uh, let's have the lady right here. And then we'll, we'll go to the back. Hi there. My name is Raven Bukowski. I'm a second year uh, student strategic studies concentrator, and I also work for the Department of Defense. I'm a big fan of the book. Um, mm -hmm. I, I agree with, with all of your prescriptions. Um, they're very well laid out. Mm -hmm. But in order to accomplish them you know, and, and, and reduce spending, um, the gigantic DOD budget seems to be a good place to start. And unfortunately, in this time, we do face a lot of uh, security threats abroad and also have a great stake in securing our national interests abroad. So if you could um, recommend one or two um, areas uh, of reform for our uh, national security strategy. And will you please sign my book afterwards? Thank Love you. Love to. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's a good question. Um, as it happens, uh, I wrote a book, uh, published a book about that very subject last year called The Frugal Superpower, and I'm glad to say that this book agrees with that book. <laughs> um, and uh, just to, to summarize the relevant point, uh, which we do mention uh, here, uh, defense spending, like everything else, is going to have to be cut. We think that a robust, uh, extensive American global role is important, and that costs money. Uh, and furthermore, uh, it is the case that we cannot solve our fiscal problems just by cutting the defense budget. There isn't enough money there, even if we were to cut all of it. Uh, our, pro our basic problems, our biggest problems, are entitlements, not defense. Nonetheless, defense surely can be and will be cut, and uh, our view is that while we do need a large defense establishment and an expensive defense establishment, there are things that we can and should and probably will cut. And first and foremost are the kinds of post-Cold War interventions in which we have engaged, beginning in Somalia and Bosnia and currently in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we're not going to see those again because we can't afford them. Uh, somebody over here made some... Okay, a gentleman uh, in, okay. in the back there. Hi, my name is uh, Chad. I'm also a class of 2009, and I also work for the Department of Defense. Uh, going to your point about the spending and sort of the... You mentioned that the uh, green collar, which was pretty interesting. You also mentioned your book. One of the things that we're looking at in Department of Defense is going green. And... What are your takes if, based on the, the power of our purchase, since we are the largest consumer of energy, that if we challenge the free <coughs> market to produce results in about two to three years, you know, instead of the arguments about spending money in, in infrastructure, Keynesian versus Milton Friedman, we just say, do both and produce results and we drop our energy consumption and revolutionize the market? Well, you know, um, uh, there is a whole group of, uh, this takes me to a previous book, Green Hawks in the Pentagon, you know. And I think there's nothing uh, more valuable than, rather than going down the Solyndra route of trying to help pe fund people commercializing technology, uh, we need a race to the top on energy. Uh, just have the Pentagon say, whoever comes up with an, 
uh, a new generation Abrams tank that gets, you know, I'm making this up, 50 miles to the gallon, um, we'll buy them all. You will have the market. Whoever comes up with this level of efficiency of solar panels, we will buy them all and put them up on every base in the country. So we should be using our buying power when buying power. And we don't do, we talk about it, but we don't actually do it. And, you know, if you actually set a really high standard and then just put it out there and see which trout jumps for that fly, that's the way to do it, rather than trying to pick this one or that one, you know, in any, in any state. Um, you know, in, in, in Hot Fly and Crowd, I have a chapter called Out Greening Al-Qaeda. Um, because, as you know, someone in the military, uh, the best way to prevent roadside bombs is not to be on the road. Um, and, the, and almost all, you know, a huge number of roadside bombs were in convoys trucking fuel, um, you know, from one place to another. My favorite quote from that book is from um, uh, uh, a guy who was an energy cult consultant for the Army who said, when we leave Iraq, it will be the biggest transfer of air conditioners ever known to mankind. <laughs> um, and so the Army is a great place to start this. The Secretary of Navy, Ray Mabus, has done a lot of work on this. They flew a F, um, uh, an F-18 Hornet, I think, uh, on mustard seed last year and uh, broke the, um, uh, the sound barrier. And so um, I think there's a lot of potential there, uh, but we haven't pushed it as aggressively as we should. Um, you know, there's a, it needs a price signal. And we're trying to do it the easy way, by government push, but without fixed, durable consumer pull, um, it isn't sustainable. And fixed, durable consumer pull um, only comes from a price signal. When gasoline was nearly $5 a gallon, you couldn't buy a Toyota hybrid Prius at Coleman Toyota in Bethesda. Their waiting list, they stopped taking names. And when gasoline is $2 a gallon, you cannot sell a Toyota hybrid Prius at Coleman Toyota. Um, so price matters. And without a price signal, you don't have fixed, durable consumer pull. Therefore, every investment is a risky investment. It depends on some government program, some loop-de-loop, -loop, and, um, and you just don't get where, 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 you, need, where you need to go. So, we, have, we have time for a couple of more questions. Um, Wait here. This young lady here. Thank you so much. My name is Sam, and I'm an intern with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Mm -hmm. And the center actually does a lot of stories on issues of climate change. And I think I really do agree that we need to move away from, fo from fossil fuel. fuel. Yeah. But the problem um, with that is I just want you to elaborate more on what your theory is when you raise the price of fossil fuel. fuel. Wouldn't that raise the price of everything else in the world? And wouldn't people just get used to it? Like you said on your first chapter mm -hmm. is that, you know, people just get used to whatever happens that, you know, doesn't go to their, you know, it's not their expectation, but they just like, oh, the elevator is broken. Sure. It's been broken for six months. Well, that's, that's a good yeah. question. So, you know, basically, I'll, I'll just take that real quickly. Um, uh, imagine that I invented the world's first cell phone. And I came to Jessica here, the dean, and I said, Jessica, I have a phone you can carry in your pocket. She'd say, Tom, a phone, a phone I can carry in my pocket? So like I can call SICE donors and alums like 24-7, uh, 365? That's right, Jess. I have a phone you can carry in your pocket. What would she say? She'd say, Tom, I'll take 10. I'd say, wait a minute, Jessica, wait a minute. This thing called a cell phone, they cost $1,000 each. She'd say, no problem, Tom. A phone I can carry in my pocket would change my life. It would give me a whole new set of functions I've never had before. So her one, her one, him one, him one, her one, you one. What happens? You know what happens. Six months I'm back here at Johns Hopkins Ice. My cell phone now weighs half the amount and costs only $500. Why? Because I've moved down the cost volume learning curve heading toward the Chindia price, the price where my thing called a cell phone will scale in China and India. Remember, oil, gas, uranium, 
Those are commodities. What happens when you create more demand for a commodity? The price goes up. Cell phone, solar cells, those are technologies. What happens when you create more demand for a technology? The price goes down. You know that from your iPhone. I love Johns Hopkins size. Come back a year later. I say, Jessica, how'd that cell phone work out for you? Oh, Tom, changed my life. I've been raising money out the wazoo, OK? <laughs> Got another deal for you, Jess. See these lights here in your auditorium? I'm going to power these lights with solar energy on the roof of this building. But it is going to cost you $100 more a month. What would Jessica say? She'd say, Tom, 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 Tom. Remember that cell phone you sold me? That changed my life. Gave me a whole new set of functions I never had before. It was great. Tom, you've spoken here in this auditorium twice. And you know we already have light. <laughs> And we don't really care where the photons and electrons come from. So unless the mayor of DC comes along and says, uh, D. Ninehorn, from now on, you're going to pay the fully burdened cost of those lights. You're going to pay the cost of the CO2 in the atmosphere, cost of the troops protecting the oil from the Persian Gulf. They're now going to cost you $200 a month. What happens then? Jessica gets on her cell phone, which now costs only $25 in clips to her ear, and says, <laughs> Tom, your solar lights? I'll take 10. And then what? Then I'm heading down the cost volume curve on my solar lights. Sure, there's a transition. But remember, as you go through this transition, your higher unit cost of energy will be higher. But you will be using less energy. So your actual bill, OK? if the system works as it would in other technologies, will actually be lower. And ultimately, you're heading for a world where solar cells will be as cheap as tennis shoes. But when you're dealing with a new technology, this is the one, you have to understand, weakness of green power and power in general. It's not like a cell phone. It's not like a computer. When you went from your typewriter to a computer, you would have paid anything. When you went from a fixed line to a cell phone, you'd pay anything because you were getting whole new functions. When you go from green energy, from dirty energy to green energy, you don't get a new function. You get the same heating, the same cooling, the same mobility, and the same light. And therefore, to get people to switch, you have to have a price signal. Last question, uh, back there. Hi, Ryan Jacobs from the US Asia Institute. I'm an intern currently in DC, and I find myself being used for my ability to rely on social media and use social media more than the thoughts and ideas I have. Hmm. And perhaps, perhaps that's because I'm young and unwise, but I also feel that perhaps you have an oversaturation point with social media in your hyper-connected world that you're speaking of, where we rely on it as a communication tool, but we don't care about the ideas that are transported on it, and we don't care about the people who come up with ideas. And I wonder if you could comment on that, both of you or one of you. Thank you. Well, I've gotten in trouble, um, so don't tell anybody I said this. Um, but I've never been on Twitter, I've never been on Facebook, and I've never smoked a cigarette. And I'm planning on dying saying all three. Because <laughs> I do believe it is about the content, you know, and that I find that it's really hard, at least for me, to focus on traditional reporting, writing, thinking, and editing um, when I would be tweeting or whatever every second and, um, or posting something every second. So I famously talk the talk of globalization, but I do not walk the walk. Content doesn't matter to you if you want to have your present position for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to get a better job, content matters. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>